let me begin by introducing, we have just this truly all-star panel of two, uh, two of the best known writers on cities in the world with us, uh, Ed Glazer, the Glimp professor at Harvard, who among other things has been editor of some of the most important journals in economics, including uh, the Quarterly Journal of Economics and the Journal of Urban Economics, has written some of the most influential articles in urban economics, particularly on things like how does industry mix influence the growth of cities going forward, and did a remarkable job of taking sort of the qualitative musings of Jane Jacobs from 60 years ago and quantifying them in a way, testing them in a way that actually showed in at least my interpretation of Ed's work, that Jacob's got an awful lot right, um, sitting on her stoop and observing the world go by. Uh, and of course, wrote a book uh, three or four years ago called Triumph of the City, which among other things got him a spot on The Daily Show. And you know, a lot of people envy Ed for a lot of very good reasons, but for me that he got to be on The Daily Show is sort of the ultimate thing to envy. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, Richard Florida is a university professor at the University of Toronto. Um, again, has published widely. Uh, I think coined the term, and Richard, if I'm wrong about this, you can create. You can correct me. The creative class, uh, and wrote about the importance of creativity to development of cities. And again, wrote a very famous book called The Rise of the Creative Class. He has actually had a revision of it. Uh, again, it's a book that is very widely shared and Richard has been advising mayors of cities about how to make their cities better for more years than he probably would like to admit. So Ed is already correcting me on, on my interpretation of his paper on, uh, okay, well, that's true, Ed, I'll, I'll, I agree with you. Uh, and so with that, I'm, I'm going to ask them to kick it off with just the following question, sort of what is that we have seen um, people fleeing Manhattan and San Francisco over the course of the last 11 to 12 months. It, it's hard to dispute that. You look at vacancy rates in those cities and they've risen quite dramatically. Uh, is this something that's permanent or will these cities come back? What does it imply for the system of cities? How long might it take to see things play out? Uh, so Ed, we'll start with you. And thank you again so much for being here and take it away. Oh, Richard, thank you so much for having me. It's always great to do to do stuff with my, my old friend uh, and comrade in urbanist arms, Richard Florida. And it's amazing to be part of uh, part of this this fantastic group who's on the call. Uh, I assume when you said 30 minutes, you don't actually want me to go for 15 minutes straight on no, this, No, 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 we, no, we, no, no. We should, uh, no I, <laughs> just, I, just checking. Um, what I imagine is you guys each talk for three or four minutes. Of and course, of course. We want this yeah. to be a conversation, yes. So, sure, so uh, I, I think, first of all, uh, I think there are, there are sort of two visions of the future. One, which thanks to the vaccines that have already been mentioned, seems to be receding slightly, but it's a very dark vision, one in which the variants uh, on COVID-19 outrun the vaccines, one in which a new pandemic emerges in the next five to 10 years that's even deadlier. Uh, that is an enormously dark future for cities, for the world, for the urban service industries that employed 32 million Americans uh, before the COVID outbreak, leisure, hospitality, and retail trade that are really devastated by the, the you know, declining ability of people to enjoy connecting with other humans in, in real spaces. Um, in the good version of it, in the version in which we get our vaccines by the end of the year, perhaps, and uh, we don't have another pandemic going forward, we are still gonna be in for a bumpy ride, but cities will come back it will not even be as bad as the 1970s, but it will be tough. Uh, and I, I wanna just sketch for you a little bit of what, what I think lies behind that. Um, most importantly, uh, I think the enduring strength of cities comes from the fact that we are a deeply social species that loves being around other human beings, right? Not all of them maybe, but a lot of them. And uh, every time we've ended lockdowns, we have seen young people by the millions crowd out to be around other young people, to enjoy the pleasures of connecting uh, with the rest of humanity. This is what cities do. 
Uh, this is what cities will do in the past, have done in the past and will do in the future. Urban spaces will come back. In offices, for many of us who are over the age of 50 perhaps and have comfortable home offices, this doesn't seem too bad. For 23 year olds who are just getting started, right, and are working from home in their apartment, and I know a lot of them, this is pretty hellacious. They are in fact not looking forward to a world of working from home at all. They are looking forward to getting back with other 23 year olds in their workspaces and talking and learning and connecting. Related point, the, the office will come back in part because face-to-face -face contact is our best way for actually learning new things, right? Learning new tasks. And one thing that we've, we've heard a lot from Silicon Valley about how you know, tech, tech workers are just as productive when they're at, at home as when they're, uh, when they're at work. And we've seen this from earlier surveys of call center workers, the work of Nick Bloom, the work of my students, Natalia Emanuel and, and Emma Harrington, shows that call center workers are perfectly effective at making calls without, without being in the office. But if you look at what's happened to new hires in technology workers, if you look at what's happened to new hires in computer programmers, that's down by over 40% on burning glass, right? So pre-existing relationships can coast along, but they're not hiring new tech workers. Moreover, the, the working from home studies of call center workers showed that those workers were much less likely to be promoted when they worked from home. What does a call center worker get promoted to? You get promoted from a person who handles easy calls to a person who handles hard calls. How do you learn how to handle card calls? You're around other people and you see what they, what they do. And your boss needs to be able to identify you, which is a lot easier when your boss is next to you. So the sense of cities as places where the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air, as Alfred Marshall said 140 years ago, right? That is not going away. Now, while city life as a whole and offices as a whole, I think, have a robust future, Cities, individual cities, individual uh, downtown areas are more vulnerable than ever. There is no reason why, right, you can't see more tech companies relocating to Austin. There is no reason why you cannot see financial service companies relocating to Miami, right? Zoom has made that easier, and that will be something in the future. And I am particularly worried right now that we'll have a little bit of a replay of the 1970s as cities, for entirely understandable reasons, decide to pick up the progressive lance and pay for it with taxes on the wealthy and on businesses who then just decide to leave, right? And I think all of us should be watching, for example, the mayoral race in New York and see how that, fall, that uh, uh, falls out. Because while cities as a whole are, are, I think, safe and robust and the future of the world will continue to be urban, every city is more vulnerable. The urban markets are more competitive than ever. And cities really need to up their game in order to be places of continued economic vitality. Richard? Let me build on what Ed said, but first give him a plug. I, I don't think anyone mentioned it, and I don't think Ed mentioned it. Ed has just submitted a new book. I hope you're okay with me mentioning this, Ed. Um, I think it's called Survival of the City, and it's going to be remarkable. I have not read it, um, but I think it's going to be a remarkable take uh, and a very timely take. So congratulations, <laughs> everyone. Get ready, because there's a new Glazer book, which will be a touchstone for all of us thinking about City's future. Oh, thank you, Ed, for that, for that link. Um, Thank you, Richard. I, I think Ed has provided the big picture, and I'll just put some exclamation points around some of his. I, I think that what we saw at the beginning of this pandemic was a very American, and someone you can see Toronto, an American who spends at least half of the year in Toronto, a, a very American take about the death of cities. And I think the gloomsters and doomsters came out of the woodwork. Uh, that wasn't unexpected to me. Um, but, you know, I went back, I read Ed's work, I read a lot about pandemics. Ed and I have talked about this and others. And, Cities have survived bigger and worse. They will survive again. And I think, you know, it's very interesting, you know, seeing how fast things are coming back to normal. I'm speaking to you from our winter home in Miami Beach, where, like it or not, things are almost back to normal. They're, they're certainly too normal for me. And there's an increasing expectation among people here that people intend in-person meetings. I mean, I find that ridiculous and I'm over 60 and I'm, I'm worried. Uh, but there is an increasing expectation and almost everyone I talk to has, you know, I visited Miami Beach. I came on a plane, you know, I went there with my family. It's so, look, I think things are going to return to normal or something, not normal, but something like normal. And by the way, um, I fully expect this summer to be a big boom in U.S. tourism. Uh, it's going to be hard to visit Paris. It's going to be hard to visit Venice. If you go to Canada, you got to go to a COVID hotel. You're not going to go to the Greek Isles. You're not going to go to the Amalfi Coast. Where are people going to come? 
They're going to come to Malibu and California beaches, and they'll probably take their family to Disney. I wouldn't, but they would. Uh, they'll go to Orlando, and they'll end up in New York City. And I fully expect this to be quite a bit more uh, rambunctious than many others. Uh, look, for all of you, I think this is the biggest revolution in real estate I've ever seen. And part of this is because I've never been, I'm not a real estate professor and I'm not an economist, I'm an urban planner. As Richard said, I advise governments. I've never been so drafted to be part of real estate things in my life. That's telling me something that, that people are looking for different kinds of thinking. And the reason is your industry is changing in, in big ways. Maybe, maybe not as big as, as, say, the 1920s and 30s when suburbanization took hold and people began in the 40s and 50s to write about malls, but in fairly significant ways. Um, part of this is that, is that we kind of focus, for, you know, it's funny, I, I, I gave a talk at WeWork several years ago. And the folks at WeWork, I said, why aren't you building these? co-working spaces in the suburbs and they laughed me out of the room like uh, there was no, there was cacophonous hysterical laughter why would we build a we work in in the suburbs well the fact of the matter is more people live and work in suburbs than do in cities and we've done a lot of very interesting thing in cities uh but not such interesting stuff in the suburbs so i i think there's a lot of emphasis on this part of the emphasis is how do we configure a home for remote work and remote learning and you know we, we know how to make the fantasy kitchen but how do we make the home work better, you know, for remote work and remote work learning? But how do we make ecosystems for remote work? Uh, not only in, in, in urban centers where these young folks, the 23 year olds are gonna go, look, young people are gonna go to cities in droves. They're not gonna be happy to stay in mom and dad's basement, you know, or in the house in the country. They're gonna be flocking back to cities, you know, en masse. But, but for other folks, people who are our age, uh, who have families who want better schools, the suburbs are, are a place for many and, and also in rural areas. I think one of the things the pandemic has done, and Ed, I'd love your comments on this. The metropolitan area is defined typically as a labor market commuting shed. Now that's still going to be true, but I think what it's done is, is when my dad had to buy a house, my dad worked in a factory in New Jersey, he lived in Newark, he moved about 10 minutes away to North Arlington, New Jersey. Now I think with remote work, you can have a farther range of moves out of the so-called say metro, and you can consider Austin or Miami or Bentonville or Bozeman or Park City, whatever. The other one is I think the office. I think Ed is absolutely right that our central business districts, maybe, maybe New York comes back strong. And I have a hypothesis about New York that it will, will attract more global headquarters. You know, right now, if you're in Toronto, you can't travel. You can't leave or come back, but, but if you're in New York, eventually, you know, you'll be able, and I think it will attract more global companies from London, from Hong Kong and others. But what about Detroit? What about Toledo? What about Akron? What about Chicago even? So I think there will be some recomposition of the central business district and, and some adding of residential uh, and some reconfiguration. And, and the office in a sense becomes a perk and it's no longer a cubicle where you plug your laptop in. It's more experiential. It's, and, and the way I like to think of it, you plan your, your day at the office like a local business trip. You're meeting colleagues, you're doing a meeting, you're going to lunch, you're grabbing coffee. But I think the big opportunity is for office in the suburbs. And you know, uh, Richard Pizer said something about industrial. Uh, this is very fascinating to me. The idea, and you know, we're working on this in Tulsa with Tulsa Remote. How would you build a new kind of office park, if you will, or a new kind of office environment a hub of activity, perhaps mixed use, 15 minute neighborhood in a suburban or rural configuration, which attracts remote workers, but gives them many of the semblance of the things Ed has written about of city amenity, a coffee place, a fitness facility, whatever it be. So I think what's fascinating about this from, from, the, from the perspective of the home, the multifamily development, the office park, there is an incredible time of reinvention and disruption in real estate, which is for, for my mind, one of the most, maybe the most interesting time of my life. So Richard, let, let me pick up on uh, the theme that you've just raised about the suburbs. Uh, I think, uh, well, I don't know if you're surprised, I'm surprised at how much uh, uh, prices uh, and actually uh, home building has gone up uh, where they have land uh, in suburban and even remote suburban locations. Um, uh, the question, and I'll start with that again, uh, uh, is this shift to the suburbs uh, uh, permanent? Is this a reversal of the return to the city that everybody's been so excited about over the last 10 years? Or do you expect it to uh, 
uh, revert uh, once uh, things return to uh, normal? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm with Richard in the sense that this is a deeply interesting, exciting area, a time to be in. And um, there's no question that Zoom has, in some sense, uh, reduced effective commuting costs because you can certainly imagine that you would commute only three days a week. That's sort of a very natural thing to think about. And that may mean that you're going to commute from somewhere really far away. Uh, and it may mean that you're going to commute uh, commute close. I mean, certainly when I imagined the, the relocations made possible by Zoom, I sort of imagined the whole sort of small tech startup relocating from Silicon Valley to Vail because they love skiing or, or Honolulu because they love surfing, but still being in a place that's sort of urban enough for them for them to connect. But it is certainly true that America is, uh, you know, an overwhelmingly suburban nation, and there is a, a great deal of, of uh, hunger for urban amenities in a suburban space. So I think that's entirely right. Um, but I think it's going to depend a lot on the nature of the suburb and the nature of the market. Um, so, you know, again, no place is guaranteed of success. Uh, a, a general Being a general anchor for high skilled people, either because you're a university or because you have other forms of local amenities are, are, is going to be yes. really powerful. The other thing to remember in terms of the of the, the office, and I think Rich is exactly right, that we really want to think about, you know, offices of the future as being more like playgrounds for the high end of the market. Yes. But it is worthwhile remembering there, there are still office workers, and maybe those jobs won't remain, but there are still office workers who do jobs that are sufficiently hard to define that you can't just send them home and tell them to do it. You know, the ability to sort of monitor people uh, is also a valuable, valuable asset on this. So um, it's and that's that's less of a uh, that's less of a playground office. That's more of an office in which everyone can sort of work together and make sure that they're they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And and, and I were talking about this beforehand. It's interesting the signals coming out of the finance, insurance, and real estate community. And you saw the comments by Goldman Sachs. We're coming back to the office. My friends who run big real estate firms in Toronto and New York, folks are going to come back to work. But in the tech community, they're saying, no, 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 no. You know, we'll go remote at the same time. And Ed and I were talking about this as well. Um, Facebook and Google and Apple are snapping up those buildings in New York City. And I think for exactly the reasons Ed talked about, the young people. They are going to be places that you're going to onboard this young talent, which gravitates to these superstar cities. But one other comment, I think, I think that there will be more losers than winners from this. And I think the winners, Ed has written about this, but there's something uh, very fascinating about this. It, it is going to be those that have a lot of amenities. There, that amenity, if you will, both, now, he mentioned Vail, remember you mentioned Vail, skiing or Honolulu for surfing. Uh, if you're a place with natural amenities, and you could be a smaller place, you could be Jackson Hole or Bozeman, or you could be the Hudson Valley outside of New York, you know, lovely places in Vermont. Um, Natural amenities will attract people and, and there'll be these younger folks and then people who have an urban vibe who will be attracted to big cities where, where that unique bundle of amenities you get in New York City, you, you can't really get many other places or any places in the world. I think the generic places have a tougher time. So, so I do think this price premium will go to places with, with amenity. And then, and then the only other one I would add is if you can define yourself enough around making remote work uh, desirable. If you could create development capacity, real estate development capacity, it's just for a remote worker, we have an ecosystem that's more appropriate for you. That could elevate a few places that are more generic that could compete on that one, one, one characteristic. So you know, I'm sorry. You know, just, I just want to add one, th one thing on that. One thing to think about when you think about amenities is there are some amenities that are you know, low density outdoor amenities that are more likely to be uh, associated with a more suburban future. That's Vail, that's any place in which sort of the great outdoors is what's going on. And then there are places like New York or Paris, where in fact, it's the central city that has the amenities, right? It has centuries of investment in architecture and art museums and a thriving scene. And those are areas in which I think we should think to expect to see the central city be more dominant uh, going, fo going forward as well. 100%. So, um, I'm going to have a two-part question here is it relates to Los Angeles. So we have a lot of people in this meeting who do work in Los Angeles, which sort of doesn't fit either of your categories. It is, um, it is unique. Uh, it's not exactly suburban, uh, but it doesn't have a central city, which is the focus of jobs. There is no particular job center in Los Angeles that has more than I think 6% of the jobs 
in the metropolitan area. They're scattered all over the place. So what does all this mean for a place like Los Angeles, which is arguably a unique place in this regard? Although, Richard, I think Toronto may have more in common with Los Angeles than any other American city. It's pretty spread out, uh, although it has pretty well-defined central business district. Uh, and, and more specifically, one of the drivers of Los Angeles economy has been creative people. Uh, my colleague Elizabeth Curran Halkett writes about how there are more artists in Los Angeles than there are in New York. That's not artists per capita, that's number of artists, even though New York, Los Angeles is a smaller city than New York. How do artists work? I mean, part of being an artist is being lonely and being in your studio and painting or writing and not letting people bother you. But a lot of the arts involves people actually being together. You can't do theater without being people together. You can't make movies without being together. You can't play music without people being together. So um, thoughts about what all this means for Los Angeles and in particular for cities where the arts are an important driver of people's desire to be there. So let me, let me start. We did a report with a fellow named Mike Seaman, who's an expert, like Elizabeth, who we both know for a long time on the creative industries. I think he documented that there's been 50% unemployment among visual and performing artists. So it's been an absolute decimation. I mean, it's probably the hardest impact economic sector. I haven't looked closely, Ed may have, but it's been an absolute decimation. You know, artists have multiple career streams. They, they learn how to make like the background behind me or they hook up my lighting rig and they can freelance, but it's not like having your career. They're, they're also well. waiters and those jobs have oh. taken a really hard hit. So artists have taken it tough. I think, on Los Angeles, I, I, I bet on Los Angeles. You know, I, I go back to a stupid statistic that I remember looking at that the place that gained the most population after the Spanish flu that moved into the top 10, it became, went from outside the top 10 US metros in population to number five was Los Angeles. So I think one of the peculiar things that I've seen in this pandemic is people moving to warm outdoorsy places. And that goes more for Miami and Texas and less for Los Angeles, but I think Los Angeles has a lot to offer. I think what I've seen for migration out of Los Angeles is driven by two things. One is simply cost. And, you know, I say this all the time, and Ed, may you get, may get a kick out of this. Um, you know, people talk about the exodus from New York City. And I said, if I can get a five-bedroom townhouse in New York City for the same price that I can get a five-bedroom house in Charlotte, I'll take it. And I bet I'm not the only American. So price has a lot to do. I mean, you're all urban economists, you know this. And Los Angeles is horrifically expensive at the Metro level, much more expensive than the New York Metro. But the other thing I think that's challenged Los Angeles and that you see a lot in the headlines is there are wealthy people, members of the 0.001% who don't like to pay as much taxes and are worried about tax increases both coming from the Biden administration, and you hear lots of rumors, Richard, I'd, I'd like your comment on this, about a wealth tax in California. So whether that's true or not, and I don't know, I haven't kept up, but what I see from friends moving to Miami is we're leaving California because, not because we didn't like it, not because it's not lovely, not because the weather's not nice, it's nicer than Miami, we're worried about taxes. And I, I think we shouldn't make too many predictions. So my hunch is Los Angeles remains an attractive place, prices go down maybe a little bit, but maybe it does lose some high net worth people. So uh, a couple of things, I, I, I agree completely with everything that Richard said. A, a couple of things, I, I put in the chat room a link to a paper that I did in over the summer, uh, which was surveying small business owners. And we certainly found that the arts was uh, easily among the most devastated industries uh, by COVID, uh, that the, the closure rates were just absolutely extraordinary. Um, and uh, you know, that's, it's of course gonna be one of the industries that's gonna, gonna be most eager to leap back once vaccines are, are widespread. Um, like Richard, I see a lot to, to like in Los Angeles's climate. I mean, it has been, a, been an allure for uh, migrants for 150 years, and it's likely to be even more important in a world in which, uh, as he said, we care about face-to-face uh, -face, uh, connections outdoors rather than inside. Um, you know, it's, I've got a foot and a half of snow outside my house right now, and it's pretty hard for me to use outside space to meet people. So it's, um, um, but let me, let me riff a little bit more on his comments about the sort of political challenges facing, facing LA. Um, I, one of the chapters in, in my new book focuses on gentrification in Boyle Heights. 
which unfortunately I didn't get to visit. Usually I like to actually visit the places that I write about, but I did watch all eight episodes of Gentified to try to get myself into the mood, which was, uh, which was about it. Um, the, um, the, the sort of story of, of the battles over gentrification, really for me, the background of that is the collapse of building in California. That if you sort of think back in 1970, right, we didn't have battles over these things because it was easy to build. In fact, it was easy to build in Boyle Heights when it was once sort of a builder's paradise that provided affordable housing for middle income Los Angelinos. Um, and for the last 50 years, uh, and I don't know where you want to take your point in the inflection point, Friends of Mammoth or whatever, whatever change of the, of the building environment, it has become uh, just a very different world in terms of building in Los Angeles. And it's not as if there isn't land. Uh, it's a medium or low density metropolitan area by global standards, uh, but it is very difficult to build. And so the competition over the space that remains is incredibly fierce. Right. And it gets highly politicized and it gets part of this sort of progressive wave that we see in, you know, the potential for wealth taxes, the potential for all sorts of, of things, which which are coming from an understandably angry place. Um, and since we're plugging each other's books, uh, let me urge you to, to you know, read Richard's New Urban Crisis from 2017, 2016, something something like that. Um, which you know was is presciently pointing out how things are going wrong in our seemingly uh, beautiful cities, and that in some sense is the great trouble with the pandemic: is it's hitting cities not as 9/11 did at their most robust, at their most triumphant. It's, it's hitting cities at a place where cities are already troubled, troubled by anger over race and policing, troubled by anger over gentrification, troubled by anger over affordability. And I think ultimately, for me at least, what lurks at the back of all these problems is a tendency of our society increasingly to prioritize insiders over outsiders. So the things that happened in California since 1970, including, for example, Prop 13, are things which meant that if you bought a house in Los Angeles in 1970, you did fantastically well. But if you were a kid born somewhere else hoping to move into Los Angeles in 2010 or 2015, right, these changes were not taking care of you in part because the, the real estate industry was not empowered to take care of you as it had historically by building the kind of space that you would need. And I, I think going forward, as we try to address the, the very real complaints of the outsiders in our system, we need to do so in a way that doesn't induce the, the you know, insiders who actually run the institutions and hire people and create jobs from leaving our productive cities like Los Angeles. So while I'm entirely behind the view that we need to do you know, more to promote upward mobility, to promote affordability. I believe there are ways of doing that in a way that does not have a zero sum aspect where you're basically robbing one person to, to take care of the other. I want to say just two more things about Los Angeles, Richard, because so many colleagues from Los Angeles are on the line. First of all, it's a city you know that I love. I enjoyed my time with, with you all at the center. Um, I think Los Angeles faces kind of two challenges and two opportunities. Um, one challenge, which it's politically incorrect to talk about, but this fellow named David Milner sent, I think Ed was on the list. He sent around an interesting essay that he published. He's a downtown development expert called Downtown Discontent. Mm. And it was about this wave, not just of crime, but this wave of, you know, I talked to the mayor of Miami, the, the county, Daniela Levine Cava, and she called it COVID stir crazy is what she used for it. This wave of petty crime, car thefts, I read today in the New York Post, which is my daily reading, that ladies. Gaga dog walker, you probably saw this, got shot and her dogs were kidnapped in Los Angeles. You know, we see this in malls. We see this in my neighborhood in Toronto where 70 cars were stolen over the summer, my small neighborhood. Look, there's something there that we've got to wrap our arms around and we can't keep pushing under the rug. Uh, the second thing, you know, with regard to Los Angeles that I learned when I was visiting Richard Green is that schools typically are very far away from people where people live. Um, it was not uncommon for me to talk to colleagues at USC that were driving their kids a half hour, 45 minutes or an hour to a private school. That's tough for most parents, I, I think. So those are two on the negative side. On the positive side, I think this idea of less commuting, more remote working, the 15 minute neighborhood advantage is a city that was gridlocked like Los Angeles. If you can get cars off the highways, my Lord, it makes the prospect of living in Los Angeles much better. And I'd say one more thing. When I wrote Rise of the Creative Class, the hot cities were the Bay Area, Austin, New York. If I talk to young people today post-college, I might put Los Angeles at the very top of that list. It's New York is there still, but boy, oh boy, there's something in the popular mind that these youngsters love 
you know, and, and it's downtown Los Angeles and maybe it's Venice and maybe it's Santa Monica. You know, the communities better than I do the West End. There is something in the popular consciousness that makes me think that Los Angeles will have a fair shot and a good shot at attracting these young, talented people who, who in the past would have gone to Boston, New York, uh, maybe Washington in the Bay Area. Well, I think one thing is, you know, we saw a very large increase in presence of tech companies in what's called Silicon Beach. And I think part of it for young people is as expensive as LA is, it's much less expensive than the Bay Area. Yeah. So if you can get a Google type salary or you get a Netflix salary, Netflix apparently pays very, very well. Um, and you can live in Venice for less money than it costs to live in uh, Malpitas, then uh, LA looks pretty good. If that's, if, if you're focusing on California. If I can pick up on housing prices, I, I, we're kind of in a, an asset price bubble now because uh, interest rates are so low. Uh, uh, do you see that continuing? Uh, is there much hope for really uh, getting uh, a lot more affordable housing going? I would not want to be, in a, buy a, be a person who bought a suburban house or a house in the Hamptons or a waterfront house in Miami now. I just think this pandemic, I mean, we've already seen stories about it. This pandemic buying, my, my, all of my relatives are in the Michigan suburbs. Where people are paying for homes in the Michigan suburbs or in northern Michigan just boggles my mind. So I, I think you're right, Rick, that there, there's something going on that's related to the COVID crisis in certain of the country that there is a, a bubble. And just to, just to echo that, you know, the, the, the point that I made, I, I gave a, the, the Elon lecture for the American Economics Association about six years, and it was titled A Nation of Gamblers, A History of Real Estate Speculation in the U.S., uh, where I sort of emphasized that betting on real estate was America's greatest pastime and had been so for the past 400 years. Um, the, uh, the, the, the point that I tried to make is that the mistake that investors have made for centuries is to underestimate the power of supply to determine prices in the long run. So that gives you relatively little guidance in a market like Los Angeles, where supply is really constrained. But you're not going to convince me that suburban housing in Michigan can't essentially be produced, uh, you know, forever, which means that paying substantially over, you know, the normal premium over construction costs for housing in those areas, that's almost assuredly going to lead to buyer's remorse at some point in time.